Please be seated. There was a comedian one time that uh, talked about going into the shoe shop and he was looking for a pair of sneakers and, and he tried a pair on and he told the, the sales clerk that uh, they're too tight. And the sales clerk said, well, why don't you try it with the tongue out? And he said, they're no good if they'll be tight. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that gets us to sneakers. Uh, sneakers are a fashion statement anymore. You know, they bring hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and lots of times people buy them and just put them on a shelf so they can look at them. They don't even wear them because it deteriorates the value of them. You know, I think to me this all started with. Um, Michael Jordan, remember Air Jordan? Uh, that was about the first one, but you know, there's all kinds of people, not just sports, but all kinds of people have their own sneakers now. And people collect these things. And it's just hard to believe. In 2017, this market was $62.8 billion. Sneakers. I found one you probably never heard of. This is. Uh, Nike Air Max 97. Jesus shoes. Jesus shoes. Uh, you know, if you're going to have shoes for a celebrity, there's nobody uh, better than to have shoes with Jesus on them. Now, these are special shoes. They have a, a gold crucifix on the laces. And, and uh, you know, instead of having the gel in the bottom, of the shoe for cushion. They have holy water. And, and supposedly it comes from the River Jordan and there's a priest that prayed over this water to make it holy. Whew. They thought, the thought was, well, if, if a person buys Jesus' shoes, what are they expected to do for him? Well, you know, he'd be walking on water. <laughs> You know, I got sneakers on, they got a cushion. If that was holy water, I'd be walking on water instead of chill. The price on these things, this one, the, the bid so far when I printed this out was $1,663. Some of them sold, one sold for $1,380. Can you imagine paying that kind of money for shoes? This leads us into our text for today about Peter trying and failing to walk on water. It's not important that Jesus walked on water. It's not important to us that Peter tried to walk on water and failed. The important thing to notice here today is that Peter got out of the boat in the first place. He got out of the boat. Peter was trying to walk on water, and that was a perfect image of what it is to become a, a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a perfect image of what it is to be committed to Jesus Christ. Now, Peter got out of the boat, but all of the disciples were in the boat. But only one got out, and that's Peter. I'd like to share part of the text with you here today again, and this comes from the message. It says, as soon as the meal was finished, he insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the people. And with the crowd dispersed, he climbed the mountain so he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to the sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, 
If it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Come. First thing we learn from Peter's story is uh, to come to Jesus even if we have un unanswered questions. Why do we hold back in making a decision to follow Christ and be so committed? Are we waiting for that one article that we read that really touches our minds? Are we uh, waiting for that moment when we sit down in a discussion at Sunday school or a Bible study or just a group of Christians that really answers our questions and give us the uh, hope that we need? Nobody has all the questions answered. Jerry Kramer was an offensive lineman for the Green Bay Packers, and he uh, played under Vince Lombardi. He wrote a couple books, and uh, in his uh, book, Distant Replay, Kramer reflected on his own mortality. Uh, he said that uh, while he was playing football, he was in good health, and, and there wasn't any reason for this, but he, uh, he, he thought a lot about his mortality and worried about it. His father died, and he said that hit him hard. He writes, I think his death was more difficult for the family than it was for my father. Dad was a very religious man, and he was ready to go. He had his faith, and he said that he was locked in the arms of the Lord. He writes, sometimes I wish I had that kind of faith. And Kramer continues, but I don't. I just have questions. I just have questions. You know, I respect his honesty in this writing. Anyone who wrestles with uh, questions of faith, I think, is to be commended. Uh, if we leave those questions unexamined, it's hard to stand through the storm. Truth is, Jesus left his disciples behind with unanswered questions. And I think he did that deliberately. By doing so, uh, he made them work for the answers. John C. Wright uh, was a former lawyer and award-winning science fiction writer, and he was a commu uh, committed atheist. But one day, he prayed. And this was his prayer. He says, Dear God, I know that you do not exist. Nonetheless, as a scholar, I am forced to entertain the hypothetical possibility that I am mistaken. And then he asked God to reveal himself to uh, Kramer, or to uh, John in, in a certain way. And he thought if his prayer goes unanswered, that's his proof that God doesn't exist. And if, he, if God does answer his prayer, then the world for him would open up. God answered his prayer. John writes, something from beyond the reach of time and space, more fundamental than reality, reached across the universe and broke into my soul and changed me. I was altered down to the root of my being. It was like falling in love. It was like falling in love. And can't you just experience that from what he said? This sounds a lot like uh, Peter's experiment on the water, doesn't it? He got out of the boat. This man prayed even though he was a self-proclaimed atheist. He was willing to try. He was willing to step out of the boat. The second thing we can learn from Peter is to come to Jesus even if we're in the middle of a storm. This scene is in the middle of a storm. It tells us the boat was battered, battered by the waves. Life has its storms, doesn't it? We go through storms every day. So how do we respond? The other 11 
took shelter in the boat. Only Peter stepped out. Author and speaker Palmer Chinchin said he went on an excursion rafting at the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe. We talked about Zimbabwe this morning, didn't we? The Zambezi River has a, a place called Victoria Falls. Victoria Falls drops 335 feet. It's a, an exciting raft trip from what I read. Just before they were getting ready to leave, he said the uh, guide said to him, when the raft tips over, he didn't say if the raft, tip, raft tips over, he said when, and that scared uh, uh, Palmer some. But then he told him, when the raft tips over, stay in the rough water in the center don't go out to those places where the wall, water looks calm and in the eddies. And they asked the reason why. And the guide said, that's where the crocodiles are. <laughs> now, the wind got me, but uh, when they mentioned crocodiles, I don't think I'd get in that boat. You know? I'd step out of the boat. Palmer said, God calls the church out beyond the comfort zone of still stagnant waters. Can you picture that? The comfort zone of still stagnant waters. But yet there's crocodiles in that water that uh, feed on us, that draw us away from God. But we have to go out into the rough waters and experience the help of Jesus Christ. You know, many of us wait to make a decision. We wait until we're older. Um, or we say we're going to wait until we have kids. Or we're going to wait until we get our heads straight. Or we wait until we're not so busy. Or we'll wait and make that commitment when we feel worthy. And that's the worst answer of all. When we are worthy. We're all worthy. The problem is there's always going to be storms. And our purpose is to face those storms alongside of Jesus Christ. Lastly, we can learn from Peter's experience not to let anything stand between ourselves and Jesus Christ. You know, Peter almost made it. He took those first few baby steps on top of the water. And then he let the fear and the circumstances take away his focus. And he began to sink. We do the same thing. We begin to commit to Christ. And when we do, we begin to be involved in different ministries. And sometimes we hear negative talk about that or, or something goes wrong and instead of staying through the storm, we walk away. What if Peter had made it all the way to Jesus? Think about that. Just jump out of the boat and walk on water, walk over to Jesus, stand alongside of him. Simple, wouldn't it? But he didn't learn anything that way. This way he learned to depend upon Jesus when he began to sink. Author Vince Vitale was sharing his faith with a man named Joe. He writes about it. Joe was diagnosed with a brain tumor and the prognosis was bad. Vince Vitale writes that he was able to share with Joe that the message of Christianity is that and what makes us that what makes us right with God has nothing to do with anything we do or ever do, but rather 
with what Jesus has already done once and in full and for all. He explained that if we trust in Jesus Christ, we no longer need to fear judgment because on the cross, Jesus has already taken the judgment for everything that we have done or ever will do. His friend Joe prayed to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. The next day, his family came. They asked him how he was doing, and he said, Wonderful! Now I'm actually looking forward to what's next. And the family couldn't believe the change in this man, and so they called uh, Vince and asked him what he had said to Joe so that they could understand how this difference came about. It helped Joe that Vince could help him with some of the basic questions about our faith. Truth is, Jesus could have answered our every question about God and life and death and suffering, but he didn't. He could have calmed the storm and prevented his disciples' fear in the first place, but he didn't. He could have uh, held Peter's hand and let him dance a little jig across the Sea of Galilee, but he didn't. He didn't make it easy for Peter then, and he doesn't make it easy for us now. And there's a reason. Faith requires trust and love. It requires sacrifice. And every great relationship is built on these two, trust and love. And that's what God wants with our relationship. God is doing God's part. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world in the flesh to show us what the quality of life could be. And now it's our turn to do our part. Every faith journey, no matter how rocky, begins with getting out of the boat and walking toward Jesus. So are we ready to take that step? Sometimes it's baby steps like Peter. But Jesus is waiting. Jesus is waiting. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and join in our hymn of commitment. Number 593, Here I Am, Lord, 593. Mm -hmm.